Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today. You know, the MLB network is one of, one, one of the more advanced sports networks on TV today, and it might surprise people to learn that they actually use tape as a key part of their infrastructure. Joining me to explain why that is, is Tab Butler from the MLB Network. Tab, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Really exciting to be here. So before we get too far into the, the why you guys use tape, tell us a little bit about yourself and what the MLB Network's all about. Well, I'm the, uh, the Senior Director of Post-Production and Media Management. Basically, we have to manage all of the content that comes in, make it available, highly available, to all of the editing and the production team so that they can create the stories, they can tell the, the stories, the passion of baseball through the video imaging. Well, and I would think in baseball in particular, which is when I first met you, this kind of surprised me. I mean, you're, you're, one team has 160 games, times that by the whole league, you got, a, you got a data storage nightmare. You definitely do. Not only that, you also have to track, log, and identify all of that information. You're looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for a walk-off home run. You're looking for that unique video that helps you tell the story to the viewer and make it compelling. Okay, so I think what would help people understand why you guys use tape is just kind of take us through, kind of take us through the work, the life of a, a game video okay. as it throws through your system. Okay, so what we end up with is obviously we have the stadiums, and those stadiums, you're looking at 15 of those per day. That content comes back as a broadcast, and you will have more normally somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten streams that come back as many as 15 to 20 on uh, major showcase uh, events. So with ten streams coming in you may say well wow that's a lot of content. Well what are they? Well you have your home team with graphics. You have your home team without graphics. So that's called the clean and the dirty feeds. You have the away team clean. You have the away team dirty. You also end up having a backup feed. Then you have dugout camera or center field and other ISO cameras. So if you get up to 10 feeds, you can say for one hour of baseball, that equals 10 hours of content. And if you're getting wow. that much content, you've got a problem. Let me grab an eraser here for a second because if I've got that much content coming in from the field, I've got to have big storage here to grab all that. For every file that I write, I'm going to be making that available to editors to tell stories. So from the edit area, we may have as many as 200 to 250 edit workstations working on that content, making stories, more, making highlights. So this bucket starts to fill up. Now, we have large storage. I have 90,000 hours worth of storage in a single pool for the American League and also another 90,000 for the National League. Our X and our Y, our American League, our National League. So does the National League uh, disc system have a designated hitter though? Yes, it does. Okay, all It right. definitely That's, does. Okay. That designated hitter happens to be tape because <laughs> the bottom line is, is down here underneath all this stuff, I need to be able to work with content while it's important, but yesterday's games, aren't as important as today's. So they'll get written down to a tape library. We have an SL8500 with Diva as the uh, software layer on top of that. So that kind of manages that? That manages the content. So we're moving this in. And as we move that content in, you're going to be writing it to the tune of about 50 terabytes of new content per day. So that's a lot of content that you're writing in. The other problem that you face is, I've put this stuff into the library, I'm editing stories. Well, there's a great walk-off home run that 
occurred last night, but the same person did it three other times, and we want to show them all of those, so we've got to pull that content out and move it back onto the library, the spinning disk, so that it can be edited. We use partial file restore, PFRs, so that I can go into a 250 gig file and pull off just that little bit at the end of that whole file. And that comes back up, and it takes about a minute, minute and a half, to pull that content back out. So this is very interesting because your, your tape isn't just this like dead-end repository. You're interacting with it all absolutely, the time. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Scary numbers on a daily basis. We do somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 partial file restores. With the situation with tape, we started off in 2008 with LTO4 and ended up with, by 2016, January, we ended up with over 45,000 tapes. Wow. In January of 2016, we went to the Oracle T10,000D or T10KD. And when we did that, we started writing from LTO4 to T10KD as a migration. And we move 1.2 petabytes of content in that migration per month. Wow. I am down to having about 18,000 LTO4 tapes left, and they're all been, that content has been migrated over. When we do that migration, I have a copy of LTO that is an on site copy, and I also make a second copy whenever anything gets written into the SL8500, and that's my off-site. So in case something goes wrong at MLB Central, you've got a backup copy. I have a backup copy. The other thing that's very, very important about this is when I'm doing this migration from LTO, I am doing an on-site to an on-site and an off-site to an off-site, so that these are copies of known good files. If I have a file that has any problems on the copy for whatever reason, I can easily go to the off-site to make that on-site copy, but in general, what we find is that 99.99% .99 of all of our tape we are restoring, and that you're talking about petabytes and petabytes, it just automatically, or as some people call it, automagically, uh, transfers from one format to the other in the background. And when we do the, that in the background, within Diva, we have the 5,000 5, PFRs, we have usually about 5,000 uh, of the files moved for the migration, and then we have usually about another 2,000 files that, or jobs that are done within Diva on a daily basis. So on a daily basis, Diva's doing about 12,000 jobs a day. And, and I think that's really important because the, the, you're talking about incredibly low failure rates. Yes. And one of the, I, I think, huge misconceptions that we still have to deal with today is that tape isn't reliable. These numbers are proving that wrong. You guys oh, are Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The other thing is, is that speed with the partial file restores, I end up in a situation where an editor is working with a proxy, a low res uh, version. They right click on it within the application, which is Adobe Premiere with our asset management system. Our asset management system sits right up on top and that's called Diamond. And as Diamond uh, is controlling the entire stack, mm -hmm. API-wise, et cetera, 
it under the covers goes in to the robot, makes the request of Diva to restore that file. And what the editor up here ultimately sees is that his proxy file automatically or automagically ends up turning into his high res. Wow. And it's that workflow that becomes seamless and it becomes a very, very active archive. So let, let's quickly summarize. I, in your environment, one of the huge reasons here, I would assume, has to be just the cost effectiveness of the of the media, right? Absolutely. Because you, if you had to do this in disk, you would not only need brand new data centers, you would just, your budget we would couldn't, be. We couldn't afford it. The other thing is, is that if I'm storing 45,000 tapes, better known as, at this point, between the T10KDs and what LTO content I still have, I have over 70 petabytes. So if I've got 70 petabytes, that's a lot of content. Am I going to put that on disk? Baseball can't afford that. Yeah. Nobody can if it's not going to be used heavily. And for us, what we end up finding is in baseball, in content, you obviously have that long tail of content as you go over time. Very little bits get used. So I'm dealing with data at rest. And the best way to rest that data is to not consume heat and generate the need for air conditioning and power. All of that's disk. For tape, my on-site and my off-site, the costs for maintaining that library of 70 petabytes and growing constantly is virtually non-existent because you've got the cost of the tape and then you're just putting it on a shelf. Right, and, and I assume just real quickly, that this problem just is getting, if you will, worse for you because as cameras get better and it becomes easier to get more angles and all those different things, like my favorite thing is the home plate cam. Yep. I never knew how badly I needed that, right? And yep. so I, it, the scalability of tape has got to be a big advantage as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And for us, one of the biggest things is I went from 45,000 LTO4 tapes to 4,500 oh, LT10K yeah. because these, LTO4 is 800 gigabytes. Right. T10KD is 8.5 terabytes. So that's a 10 to 1. Now, my SL8500, I have 3,000 slots. So if I take an LTO4 tape, I've got 3,000 slots. But I transfer that over to T10KD, that's effectively given me 300 tapes. Right. So that means that my 3,000 slot robot can all of a sudden support 30,000 tapes worth of content that sits on my LTO4s. That 45,000, that is on site and off site, meaning that 30,000 is more than my entire LTO4 on-site content library, meaning I've got extra space in a robot that was overwhelmed with tapes at one point. That density has been phenomenal in giving us a very, very easy robotic workflow. I don't have to go to shelves anymore. Everything can live in the robot at one time. That's awesome. Well, Tab, thank you very much for walking us through this. I, I think what you're seeing here is uh, tape being used in ways that I think a lot of people just don't think of it. Uh, this is an interactive process. It's, it's obviously the cost reduction and the scalability uh, through both technology and the, uh, uh, the capabilities of tape by itself. So it, again, take a really good look at tape as, as a part of an active archive, which is a term we use a lot, uh, to be able to solve these big storage problems. Yeah, it's, it's modern tape. It really is, and this has really helped us uh, as we go forward with the next generation. We'll be LTO9, LTO10, and taking the same kind of big leap from capacity as we have before. It's awesome for us. Great, thanks very much, Tab. Thank Appreciate you. It. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us.